I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I have been working with uh, Kose and with Choa. I came down in summer to give them a little bit of training in something and then came back, uh, was here yesterday and I'm here again this morning. And um, well, as Choa said, uh, the teacher, my teacher at ZCLA, uh, Roshi Agyoku, was, is the Dharma sister of Seisen Roshi. Uh, they both received Dharma transmission from Roshi Bernie Glassman. Uh, they both studied at ZCLA for a long time. And then after my Azumi Roshi died, uh, Roshi Glassman completed their, their training. And they received Dharma transmission really right, I think at the same time or right around that. And they've been really close friends for decades. So uh, there really are wonderful Dharma relations. And if any of you are ever up in that godless place called Los Angeles, mm -hmm. please come and visit us. Uh, we're in Koreatown. We have sitting uh, Wednesday through Friday morning. Uh, we have evening programs. We have programs on Saturdays and Sundays. And, uh, and I, you're always welcome. Uh, and we also have guest rooms if you need a place to stay. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really wonderful. I, in the last year, I've had the opportunity to go to a few different Zen temples in our lineage and also outside. And um, it's just wonderful to have this flowering of the Dharma relations here in America. Um, and it's also great to go to a new place, particularly like here where it's it's so close. We're both members of the White Plum. We're both peacemaker temples. We have a lot of the same chants and everything is 99% the same and 1% different. And the 1% different is what kind of makes it interesting. It keeps you on your toes, keeps me anyway, I'll speak personally, it keeps me on my toes. So all of the, the Gator Sweet Nectar, it's almost the same except where it's different. Mm -hmm. You know, the chant this morning, you know, the, the, the gata on opening the sutra, almost the same, except a little different. Everything is like that. And it's, and it, I was thinking about this because it's been like that everywhere I've gone recently. You know, everything is almost the same. And then I realized this is what diversity is, right? All of us, we're 99% the same. And then there's that 1% that's so different and so interesting. That's the part that's like we celebrate. Like, yeah, we all started in the same place and we've gone off and become different in these different ways. And I just think it's, it's just marvelous. And of course, it is also terrifying. I'm like, oh, here I am. I'm the officiant at service this morning. I should probably get it right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't get it right, you just keep going, right? That's our practice. The practice is... You know, we do our best, we make the, our best effort, and we accept the results, and then we just keep going. We aren't going to spend all this time beating ourselves up, right? The beating yourself up is, is creating a separation. You do your best effort, and then you just keep going, and then you're just staying in the moment, and staying in the moment, and staying in the moment. And if you spend your time, you know, beating yourself up and judging yourself and all of that, you're you're not living right now. You're living in what happened, you know, this morning or earlier or yesterday or 10 years ago. Um, I haven't even gotten to my talk yet, but um, one of the senior students at ZCLA, she tells this story about how she used to go in. She went in once to see Maizumi Roshi, who was the founder of ZCLA. And uh, she went in and she was telling him, she says, Maizumi Roshi, she says, I'm the worst Zen student ever. She says, my mind, like, it's always, it's always, I can't keep it calm. Like, I try to count to 10, I can't get past one. I'm like, I've been doing this for 10 years and I just, I can't. And, and he interrupts her and he says, you are so arrogant. And she's like, I don't think you understood what I was saying. I was just talking about how terrible I was. He says, you are so arrogant. It's all about you. And so, you know, in our version of the precepts, we talk about things like, I won't elevate, I won't elevate myself and blame others. But there's the, I won't elevate others and blame myself. Because either way, when we, we're creating a gap. And so when we sit, if you sit, you know, don't judge your sitting. Don't judge your practice. Don't get up from your sitting and say, oh, that was a bad sitting period, right? 
it's not a bad, I mean, what is this bad? What does, bad is basically using an outside reference point, right? You could say, oh, busy, busy, busy mind. Okay, that's descriptive of what was going on. That's not good, it's not bad, it's just how it was. And yet, so much of our practice, so much of our life, we're just judging ourselves. We have, you know, at least in my experience, I have this color commentary going on all the time in my brain, you know, judging and, you know, evaluating what's going on. Oh, that's so stupid. I mean, or, or she's so stupid, or I'm so stupid, or whatever, you know, it's, but it's just, just this constant, you know, it's this constant voice. And that voice is this scrim that keeps us from being alive fully. Because that voice is what's creating a gap between us and reality. So my, if I was to give a title to this talk, it would be, why are you here? Um, and I'm going to start by using a koan, which, as uh, Choa said last week, are these sort of stories. Usually they're stories of old teachers that are used. Koans are, are, are gifts. Koans are guides to help us wake up, to find where we're stuck, and to get th past it. Uh, people talk about them as riddles. They're not riddles. They're just riddles to the rational mind, the thinking mind. The point of a koan, like the point of a poem, is to bypass that mind. So this is uh, from a collection that's called The Gateless Gate of the Mumon Khan. Uh, it's called Case 16, The Sound of the Bell and the Seven Panel Robe. And I like this particularly at the beginning of the year, but also because Kosei is receiving Tokido next week, and she will be having her own seven panel robe, just like this one. So in the case, it says, um, Umman said, the world is vast and wide. Why do we put on our seven panel robe at the sound of the temple bell? So Umman, abbot at a Zen center, talking to monks. So this is the reference, the frame of reference. So he says, the world is vast and wide. Why, when you hear the bell, do you put on your robe? Because that's what we do. When we hear the bell in the morning, if you have a roksu, you put on your roksu. If you have a robe, you put on your robe. But it could be, the world is vast and wide. When the alarm goes off in the morning, why do you get up? Why do you brush your teeth? Why do you eat breakfast? Why do you go to work? And so he's asking this question, you know, the world is vast and wide. Why, why do we do what we do? So there are, and when you're working with this koan, you, the, real, the real point of the koan is this question, why? And uh, why is, well, one of my colleagues said, her mother always used to say to her, why is a crooked letter? <laughs> and uh, I don't want to give away too much in, for those of you doing koan study, but why is a trick, right? Why, so the koans, as I said, are gifts. They're trying to help us wake up, but they all have little barbs in them. Each one, each koan has a little place to hook you. And it's in seeing that you're hooked. Once you see that you're hooked, you're like, oh, okay. I, what If you're hooked and you don't see it, you're just living in suffering. But once you see the hook, you're in a bigger frame of reference because you can see that you're hooked. So who is it that's seeing that you're hooked? Yeah? So the why is a hook. It's supposed to hook you. And you can spend, you know, you don't come in to uh, present this koan and say, well, explaining why you put on your robe at the sound of the temple bell. But for me, the question, ever since I first heard this koan, to me, it raises the question, why do we practice? The world is vast and wide. Why practice? Why did you come here today? Right? What is it that brings us to practice? 
And that's something I really encourage you to clarify. So, you know, why, why, you know, to be honest, it's a Sunday morning. Uh, we could be out having brunch. You know, we could be, it's a rainy, cold day. We could be snuggled up in bed. I uh, came down, I live in LA. I came down last night, I visited some friends and uh, they told me, oh, they didn't get up out of bed until 2.30 yesterday. <laughs> I was like, oh, I hate you. <laughs> but, but yeah, okay, we could be doing that. So why are we here? I encourage you to clarify it because we want to see what it is. In particular, do we have any agendas for our practice, right? When you first come to practice, if you're new, you often come because you want to get something. You know, I, I want to be uh, more calm. I want there to be less chatter in my brain. I want to be a better person. I won't want to be so angry. I want to be in better relations with my spouse or my children or my parents or whatever. And all of that is great because it gets you here. These are what I call the, the, the gaining questions, right? I want to get something out of practice. And to be perfectly honest, we all start there. We all start there. Something. Uh, someone, I uh, was in a study group this week, and the, the leader of it, Roshi Ryodo, he said, you know, people only come to practice because they're suffering. If they feel great, they're probably not going to come to a Zen center and sit against a wall, you know, and put themselves in this pretzel position and then just let see what comes up in their minds, right? That's, people don't come to Zen practice for that. They come because they're suffering. They want to get something. They want to get some relief for their suffering. And that's great. And if you sit and practice, you probably will. You probably will. Although you may not, it may not be the reason that you're sitting by the time that happens. It's a nice side benefit. <laughs> but something there is that brings us here. And in my experience, it's not the coming the first time, but it's coming the second time. If you come back, it means that you really are seeking something. That's, and, and you may think that it's, you may think I'm here for one thing, but if you keep coming back, there's really probably something else that's bringing you here. And I refer to that as your essential question. Like, what is my essential question? And, you know, for many people, they may, they may know it and they may not know it. Some people, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some of my colleagues, you know, they've know, they say, oh, I've known since I was five years old. I've had this spiritual inquiry and, you know, all of that. And, you know, the, I've, the, and I, you know the, for me, the essential question is, who am I? And so from five years old, but, you know, your results may vary. It may, that may not be your story. Each one of us, for each one of us, we have our individual essential question. And so when we come to the door, I encourage you, whatever it is that brought you here, what you wanted to get, this gaining, leave it with your shoes outside. It, it'll still be there with your shoes when you leave, right? But when we come into the Zendo, just drop whatever it is, whatever gaining thought you have, even if it's, I want to get enlightened, in particular, drop that one, <laughs> right? I want to become a Buddha. Just drop it and just sit. As Joa said recently in a video on Instagram, you know, we come in, we bow to our seat, we turn, we bow to each other. And then we just sit down and just be with ourselves. And whatever comes up, we are just bearing witness to it. We don't have to judge it. We shouldn't judge it. Of it there, see, we shouldn't judge it. Right? So Hakuin Zenji, uh, who is the 
towering figure in the Rinzai tradition. He had this saying, he said, don't put another head on top of your own. And what he meant by that is don't start judging, right? Whatever your experience is, just let your, it be your experience. Don't judge it, as I was saying earlier. Once you start judging it, you're putting another head on top of your own. And of course, we go through all of this, you know, it, it's just, it's part of the experience of practice. And then, so you, then you're gonna be like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. So then there's another head on top of your own. And then you're like, God damn it. And so then finally you have this like totem pole, this very impressive totem pole from the Northwest uh, natives, uh, First Nations, of like heads, all of them yours. And all of them are just completely vapor, right? But they seem so real. <laughs> so just let it go. We just sit and we just have the experience. Oh, busy, busy, busy mind. Not, ah. Uh, I wanted the really great samadhi I had last week. Why can't I get it? You know, I, why can't I at least order some from Amazon, right? <laughs> whatever it is, we just, you know, we just sit and let whatever comes up, come up. So when we come in, we should really have an intention, right? We're going to leave whatever we have outside the door. And when we come in, we don't want to be casual about our practice. To be casual about your practice is to be casual about your life. So when we come into the Zendo, this is why, what did you we say? The noble silence, right? When we come into the Zendo, this is the place that's been set aside for a very particular purpose, right? And it's, it, and it is in a, it's a sacred space. So we come in and we have this intention. The intention is really just to be present. You're, you can have a different intention, but to really clarify and not to be casual about why we're here. And over time, um, we just keep sitting and we just keep sitting. And, you know, um, Zen really has the worst marketing because all we can say is it's the most boring practice you can imagine. We are just here doing nothing, right? One of the, there's a great teacher from the uh, 1900s. Uh, his name was uh, Koto Sawaki Roshi. And... One of his, he was, he was, he was great one of one-liners, but one of his great, the greatest one-liners is Zen, he says, Zazen is good for nothing. <laughs> and that's exactly right, because if you, if it's good for something, then it's not Zazen. Then you're just on some self-improvement course, right? But Zazen itself is completely colorless, it is completely empty, it is completely clear. And whatever comes up is just the adornments of Zazen. And then we just come back and sit. And over time, we develop equanimity, right? Whatever the energy is that we bring in, whatever the energy is that we generate, it just moves through us. It just moves through us back and forth. And so uh, being of a certain age, uh, when I was growing up, one of the great little toys was this thing called the Weebles. I don't know if you remember them. They're like these little toys. They're actually, and they're basically like these little wooden dolls, but they have a round bottom. And so when you push them over, they just come back up, right? And so what they use, the, the tagline, the market line, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down, right? And that's, that's what our Zazen, this is what equanimity is. We talk about equanimity in our practice. This is what equanimity is. It's energy moves through us and it doesn't knock us over. It's like being in the ocean. You know, if you're standing directly facing the wave, it's going to knock you over. If you're standing sideways to the wave, it's going to pass through, pass by you. So it's it's a similar thing, which is you know all of this energy that we come in 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 in, in our minds, in our experience with other people, it's always going to it's going to rock us. Of course, this is this is what life is. Life is messy. You know, even. Shakyamuni Buddha had some difficult times, I can assure you. But, you know, you just, the energy just moves through you. You don't get stuck. So when we start on a spiritual practice, we're starting on this quest that we may or may not know what our essential question is. Pema Chodron, she says, embarking on the spiritual journey is like getting into a very small boat in setting out on the ocean to search for unknown lands. 
Like all explorers, we are drawn to discover what's waiting out there without knowing yet if we have the courage to face it. <laughs> so we get in our little boats and we push off and then suddenly, you know, land is nowhere to be seen and it's, we're in this ocean and we have no reference points and we have no stability and we are relying on ourselves. And over the course of practice, one of the great things is that as you practice, you develop confidence in yourself, right? You develop confidence. Last week, Joe was talking about um, great faith, right? So these three pillars of Zen, great faith, great doubt, great determination. And so you have the great, the great faith is from Shakyamuni Buddha onward, people have done this practice and they have, it has helped to relieve their suffering and the suffering of the world. And they have done, these are all human beings and they have handed this practice down through 2,500 years to us, to us right here. This practice does not live on a piece of paper. The practice is in, completely experiential in these bodies. Uh, Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, she has a line, she, she refers to this as the body gift, right? These are the body gifts and this is the place of practice. It's nowhere other than right here. This Zen temple, this is the actualization of the Buddha way right here. And when I say this Zen temple, I mean all of you you here in this room, you on Zoom, there's nothing else. We are the actualization of practice. So when we're practicing it and we start to have these, this judging, we start to come in and we say, we wanna get something. So we just have to keep letting go. We just keep letting go. Um, the guy I talked about earlier, Sawaki Roshi Kodo. So his, he, he, his student is another famous teacher, really wonderful teacher, uh, who wrote a book called Opening the Hand of Thought, right? So we start with this side of clenched ideas and our practice is about opening, opening it up. Like really just opening, getting out of this. So like my experience is like, if you say like, no, no is clenched, and yes is open. Right. One of the things about this practice is we get to sort of investigate what's going on in our bodies. That's really the whole practice. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to do that. But Uchiyamaro, she also has a very famous line, one that I love a lot. He says, gaining is delusion. Losing is enlightenment. Dogen Zenji, the founder of our school in Japan, when talking about what to do when you are sitting, he's giving instruction on Zazen, the basic practice of Zazen. So Dogen Zenji went to China and then came back to Japan. And at the time he came back, nobody was doing Zazen. I mean, there was all sorts of, Z of Buddhist practices, but Zazen was not really a big thing. So the first thing he wrote was this fascicle trying to sort of promote the practice of sitting. And so he's telling people what to do. Like when you, okay, you get seated, you get in your, you know, you get full lotus or half lotus. And then he says, do not think good or bad. Do not judge true or false. Give up the operation of mind, intellect, and consciousness. Stop measuring with thoughts, ideas, and views. And here he says, have no designs on becoming a Buddha. Right? So, this is the losing, right? We were giving up ideas because Dogen Zenji, he went to China because he had a, his, he had a burning question. His essential question was, if we are taught that we all have Buddha nature, why do we have to practice? Like if we all have Buddha nature, what's, why do we need to practice? And to his credit, the abbot at the temple that he was studying at, which was not a Zen temple, he says, he says, this is probably modern English. He says, kid, nobody here knows the answer to that question. You, you want to know the answer, you got to go to China, right? 
And so he goes to China and has, you know, he finds a teacher there and, and, you know, basically what he comes back and he realizes is that, you know, we just, we all have Buddha nature, but we can't see it because of our conditioning. And all of our practice is about giving up. It's about giving up. So this morning I saw in my Facebook memories, like five years ago today, I had uh, cataract surgery for one of my eyes. And I realized this is, oh, this is perfect for my talk. Uh, you know, when I had cataract surgery, so I had this lens in my eye that had just become extremely clouded. And so then I have this miraculous surgery and suddenly they replace it with a lens that's clear. And our practice is basically the exact same thing, although you can't go into a room and just have a little procedure and have it solved for you, right? This is our practice, which is, you know, we start with this clouded, this clouded conditioning. And our practice is just about over and over and over again, just letting go. So gaining is delusion, losing is enlightenment. And our, th what this practice is, is just about letting go, opening the hand of thought just being present, just clarifying for ourselves. You know, if your question is, who am I? That ends up being a question a lot of people have, their essential question. So this practice is an investigation. There's no right answer. No one's going to give you the answer. This is, uh, this is the, this is more bad marketing, right? We can't give you the answer. This is, you know, if it was so, it would be so easy if you could go into Choa and he could just give you the answer, right? That's called fundamentalism, right? Fundamentalism is they're going to tell you, this is how it is. You're going to do this. You're not going to do that. This is right. This is wrong. Problem solved, right? Zen is like the worst. It's the most opposite of that, right? Nothing about this practice will tell you, give you an answer. Sorry. For those of you here the first time, I hope I have not just completely disabused you, but better to know now. Um, we don't give answers. We just ask questions. The world is vast and wide. Why do we put on our seven panel robe at the sound of the temple bell, right? What is this life? Well, you can't order the answer from Amazon. Joa can't give it to you. You have to figure it out for yourself. The point of this of the teacher is to be a spiritual guide, right? It's to so kind of help help direct you. Usually, it's you know my experience is like particularly as when I was an, a new person, you know, I'd be like go in and say, oh, this is what's going on, and he'd be like, oh, that's totally normal. I was like, oh, really? Like. First of all, I was like, I was disappointed because I thought I was the Zen, worst Zen student in the world. But, you know, you just, you, it all gets normalized. This is part of the human condition. We are all human beings, all having 99% the same experiences, 1% completely ourselves. So we're almost out of time, or we are out of time. So I want to just end, as I said, uh, I started with a koan, so I want to end with a poem. Uh, and then we'll open it up, I guess, for questions. But uh, as I said, koans and poems, in my mind, both are aimed at reaching you by bypassing the rational mind. So I really encourage you in your practice to take some time to spend the time with, with poems, to spend the time with koans as well. The koans are trying to reach you in a certain way as our poems. This is a poem by Mary Oliver. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's about the spiritual journey. What is there beyond knowing that keeps calling to me? I can't turn in any direction, but it's there. I don't mean the leaves grip and shine, or even the thrush's silk song, but the far off fires, for example, of the stars, heaven's slowly turning theater of light, or the wind playful with its breath, or time that's always rushing forward or standing still in the same, what shall I say, moment. 
what I know I could put into a pack as if it were bread and cheese and carry it on one shoulder, important and honorable, but so small. While everything else continues, unexplained and unexplainable. How wonderful it is to follow a thought quietly to its logical end. I've done that a few times, but mostly I just stand in the dark field, in the middle of the world, breathing in and out. Life so far doesn't have any other name but breath and light, wind and rain. If there's a temple, I haven't found it yet. I simply go drifting in the heaven of the grass and the weeds.